Thank, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to, 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 discuss, to discuss this paper. I've discussed quite a number of papers at the Utah conference. I've, I've often said I discuss, I, I'm invited to discuss papers because then, then all, all the other participants can tell their deans that Chester discussed the paper and you know he doesn't ski. Uh, uh, um, but this time, but this time, this is actually a paper you know, and, and some of you have had the misfortune of having me as a discussant, but this time the paper is actually in my, in my sweet spot, maybe. Um, uh, so there's parts of, it's actually a very impressive paper. There's parts of it which I agree with, there's parts of it with which I disagree. So maybe we can, so maybe we can change the slide? Oh. Okay. I do? Oh, sorry, there you go. Sorry about that. Down there. Yeah, they covered everything. Yeah. Okay. So let me start with my perspectives. This, 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 so you can understand where I'm coming from. Uh, so I served as, as many of you know, I served as chief economist at the SEC, and it, and it happened to be in the period when Reg NMS was implemented, which is still kind of a key uh, aspect of our market structure. I late, more recently, I was on the equity, SEC's Equity Market Structure Advisory Committee. Long, long ago, I did some retail trading. Uh, so I have a little bit of perspective, not too much, but a little because it was a completely different world then. Um, I was involved in the earliest study of electronic limit order markets um, and studies of spreads over time. And actually more recently, and maybe more relevantly to the paper, I have a series of current papers with Tom, Tom Ernst and, and in some cases other co-authors on latency, on PFOP, and order by order competition, none of which are cited. And at least, and, and while the author said the PFOP, the, said the papers on PFOP were 20 years old, uh, our paper is less than a year old and uses a lot, lot of recent data. Anyway, and also I've been active in current regulatory debates. Anyway, uh, oops, wrong thing. So, so let me let me begin by motivating the issues a little bit. Why do we care about retail? Well, a lot of the interest in retail really has heightened, I think, after GameStop and a recognition that retail might actually have information and that there's many puzzles associated with, with retail. And also, you know, as, as Chris pointed out, um, the, ho the whole issue of commission-free trading. And the, the SEC sees this as, as its mission, or at least it says, that its mission is retail investor protection. Now, of course, retail people own other kind of assets too. The SEC se seems to have less focus on that, like, like um, mutual funds and 401k and 403b. Um, also, but also in Washington, frankly, there's been a growth of populism um, in, both, in both of the last two, both the current administration and the, and the prior administration. Um, and we can see this because the SEC isn't so focused on mutual fund costs. It's certainly not focused on active versus passive. It's all, all focused on fractions of a cent in, in, the, in the trading process. Um, payment for order flow and broader is, is part of broader, a broader perceived conflict uh, of interest, and I think that's also attracted attention. So the, the methodology in this paper is very nice, uh, although it has some limitations, as I'll talk about. Um, the typical methodology would be to study data that's independent of the researchers. So this, independent, this data is not independent of the researchers. That's not, not necessarily a problem, but it's not independent of the researchers. But the data typically would come from the TAC, et cetera. Uh, but the problem with that data is the brokers aren't identified, at least in the standard public data sets. So the, what the authors do is they submitted 85,000 trades. Uh, I have to tell you, I would never would have thought of doing something like that. Very impressive, actually. But the trades are often $100, um, or, but they're at least one share, and they compare execution performance. So I want to come back to that $100 and the size business. Uh, they try to randomize across firms, and they buy back in 30 min minutes to try to limit the holding period uh, vari variation in cost. And they use electronic submission when available to try to really fix and hone in on the implementation. I think all of that's really very sensible. Um, so I think the, the design has some real strengths and some weaknesses. So the matching orders and the randomization, I think that's all a really great strength. Um, the, I think a great strength is uh, the whole motivation of trying to identify these brokers. Uh, the authors can do that in the way they've approached it, whereas the data sets don't identify the brokers. Um, um, and they can also get information on the trading platform. I have a kind of a question about that, but they can get, they get information about that. Um, now, typically, on the other hand, the, broker, the brokers, I presume, can be identified by regulators, but not by professors. I think that's an important point, and, and actually that's kind of a virtue of this paper, because the SEC has a little bit of monopoly on certain data, um, and I think this has been an issue now in some of the regulatory debate. The SEC is citing in, in their current regulatory proposals all kinds of data that the industry can't possibly replicate because the SEC has the data and nobody, and nobody else uh, does. Um, um, 
So I think that's actually kind of an interesting aspect of this approach. Uh, it helps push back on that. Now I do have some concerns about aspects of the design. I think the size of orders, I understand why they did that, of course, but I think this, there's issues about the representativeness of the size of orders. There could be issues about that. And I also think it's difficult to assess the PFOP issues due to limited variation. So the paper is all motivated by the PFOP, by, by largely by this PFOP issue, but, they have, but the empirical design doesn't really allow them to drill down on that, and, that they, and they get no result, basically. Um, and then they don't cite our result, where we are able to, to, get, to get a result, and a little bit critical of PFOP, by the way. Okay, so, um, so but, but they do have some interesting insights, of course. Uh, let's see. So in particular, they, they focus on an interesting question, how does execution quality, I think, so the, I think what they have to say about PFOP is very little, uh, almost nothing, and I think this design doesn't even really lend itself to that. On the other hand, they do document very persuasively that execution quality or price improvement varies considerably among brokers, uh, and it, clearly it's not just random variation, you know, and, and Chris's point about how you, know, you can look at every hour and you get the same comparison, you know, this is very clear and, and very powerful. Uh, um, the paper, in, in that sense, also points to inadequacy in the SEC's disclosure regime. Um, uh, so what, one of the things the authors might want to do is they might want to look at the SEC's December 14th proposals, this whole series of proposals, about 2,000 pages worth. Um, um, uh, um, but in particular, one of the proposals is about the, the disclosure and disclosing more information about brokers. Um, right now, the, a lot of the disclosures are really not broker-centric. And, and you know, I think th their paper could actually help the SEC and the author, it could help the authors too in terms of cross-fertilizing. Um, and I, I think that's potentially an important uh, point. But I think, you know, the paper is also pointing to, you know, issues about how we should interpret the differences. You know, I don't have a big, big quarrel there. I do think there's differences in toxicity or informational content across the brokers. And it raises an interesting question. What should a retail customer do? Um, you know, and so how should one interpret, uh, how, how should one interpret this? Uh, clearly it's not chance, but I think it's also not incompetent brokers. Um, uh, the paper never says the brokers are incompetent, but you almost kind of get a sense that maybe the, some of the brokers are incompetent um, from, from the tone. Um, um, uh, there's a little bit of a chip on the shoulder in the paper. I think Chris had presented m with more of a chip on the shoulder, but okay. Um, you know, I think the big point is, of course, markets are segmented, and they're segmented both between retail and wholesale, which everybody kind of recognizes, but they're also segmented by these different brokers. These different brokers are different. Their orders have different characteristics and the, and the like. Um, so there's systematic differences across firms, um, and that's, what, that's one of the things that this paper is really teaching us that there's systematic differences across firms. It's not simply retail versus wholesale. Um, and, and as a result, the wholesalers, uh, potential, potentially at least, might offer different amounts of, of price improvement or even payment for order flow, although they don't, they, the payment for order flow works differently, as Chris highlighted. Um, but the, whole, the wholesalers might well provide different amounts of price improvement because the orders are of differential value uh, across the different firms. Um, you know, the, and the SEC is kind of, oh, you know, is a segmented market good? Well, you know, certainly for retail, overall, segmented market is very good because the retail doesn't want to trade with the institutions. And certainly, we, we, to the extent we care about retail, it benefits from a segmented market, which frankly, I think makes mysterious a lot of aspects of the SEC's proposal, um, um, which is designed to break the segmentation between wholesale and, and retail. I must say, I don't get it, um, um, other than maybe for political reasons. So is there, is there a failure? Now is there an interesting question that arises, not directly taken on in the paper, is there a failure of best execution? In, in my view, it, not, not exactly, partially because there's no PFOP result, um, and partially because the brokerage firms, they just don't have the same opportunities because they have, different, they have differences in the customers, despite the fact that the customers are tiny. It's kind of like wholesale versus, versus retail. Uh, you wouldn't expect, uh, I'm sorry, it's quite kind of like institutional versus retail. You wouldn't expect the execution would be the, the same. Um, should, should, should market makers necessarily offer the same degree of price improvement to different brokers? No, the brokers are providing customers with, of different quality. Um, um, you know, so, but it, but it does raise an interesting, what I call equilibrium conclusion. So customers, to the, 
to the extent that they're, they're maximizing, they should take into account execution quality received by the brokers in, re, in selecting orders. Customers should find it attractive to, 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 go, to, to align with firms whose clients are themselves not so sophisticated because then they potentially get more price improvement. And this is really a point not emphasized uh, in, the, in the paper. Um, so there's results. So there's results about platforms. I'm a little bit unclear here because I thought, I thought that the results were about platforms, but maybe the, Chris was saying that they're about wholesalers. So, I don't, um, so maybe here where I use the word platform, I should be using the word wholesaler. In any case, I, I, my main, one of my main takeaways is that the wholesalers are competitive. Uh, and this suggests that the brokers are not misrouting orders. Um, and this, this actually ties in very nicely to my most recent paper with, with Tom Ernst and, 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 and Jiang Sung. Sung. Uh, we suggest that ex-ante competition is actually more effective than ex-post competition. Ex-post competition has the problem that there's heterogeneity in the wholesaler situations. But in particular, this is also highlighting that ex-ante competition is pretty good. And so that's an interesting aspect of the paper. And I think we certainly plan to cite it, whether or not they, they cite us. Uh, um, um, <laughs> um, so then there's the issue of trade size. So trade size are microscopic. Now that's important because that explains why there's so much price improvement. The authors don't really emphasize that. The, price, the NBBO is based upon 100 shares. If, if you're trading one share, if there's any little price for the one share, that's the, you, you get that price. You, if they search legitimately, you're going to get that price. And yet the NBBO is based upon 100 shares, which may involve a lot of aggregation. There's a whole bunch of interesting papers, again in the last year or so, that are looking at these odd lot kind of issues. There's a lot of interesting study about odd lots. So, so I think the small size can certainly explain the price improvement relative to the MBBO. I also wonder about how representative these, there's 85,000 of them, but how representative are they? Do some brokers, for example, depending upon the nature of their mix of customers, place more weight on getting executions on, on larger orders, for example? Does that affect some of these relationships across the brokers? Also, would we rank brokers differently if they traded stocks with different liquidity. Um, so my perspective on PFOP, so at first I was somewhat surprised that there wasn't more of a trade-off. Um, there's lots of trades in different circumstances. But you know, then I reflected and realized, as, the, as was pointed out, that PFOP is, of course, set by the brokers. It's a fixed number, not, not by the market makers. So there's basically no variation. There's no variation to exploit. So in that sense, the design doesn't even make any sense from the point of view of nailing the PFOP issue, as opposed to what they did nail. There's a, and there's a small number of brokers. And furthermore, I don't know that there were policy changes that they could have exploited. Now, there was one ex policy change a few years ago. For example, Fidelity stopped accepting PFOP. So that would be the kind of thing, at least, that would induce, induce a little bit of variation. Um, now, we do, now, Tom Ernst and I do show, in, in the option side at least, that PFOP paying designated market makers provide worse, worse markets, and that's in options. Um, and in, in particular, um, the analysis here is based upon equity. In our paper, we look at internalization and options and equity, and it, but in particular, we show that market structure is much more problematic in options. Um, that's partially due to wider tick size, although that's endogenous, um, and adverse selection, that's also, of course, endogenous in the options. Internalization there incurs on exchanges, uh, unlike in the case of equity, um, where it's all off exchange. It's in the dock, as the SEC chair would say. I think that's not really so relevant. Um, um, one indirect takeaway, I think, is that there probably should be more emphasis also on illiquid stocks in the design here, because it's in the option context that we got kind of interesting results. Um, our, op our, op our PFOP paper also highlights uh, a key issue is the broker's incentive possibly to encourage options versus equity trading, because there's huge differences in, the, in, the, in those incentives. Okay, so one minute, not too bad. Uh, let's see. So first to summarize, I have one slide after this, but. <laughs> So it's an innovative approach. It's a good way to get at the broker effects. Highlights the differences in the execution received by different brokers. Um, I would emphasize the informational differences further and the customer's choice of broker and, and what the customer should be doing. And I would, tie, I would emphasize more the to, to help motivate the SEC's proposal on disclosure, um, which I think is maybe one of the more sensible aspects of the SEC's uh, broad set of proposals to re re remake our markets. Um, um, but at the same time, the paper is interesting, I think, from other perspectives, it's suggestive of a competition among platform, I said platforms, but maybe it's wholesalers. 
Not so useful for the PFOC versus price improvement issue. I think the design doesn't even fit it. Um, and I think the small size of trades is an important caveat. So finally, I have one other point, uh, which is not so much about, not at all about the paper, but it's just an observation. Uh, uh, it also came up in the presentation. So one aspect that assisted me is that this was the third time I heard the paper. Um, uh, I heard it in the microstructure virtual uh, exchange, and I heard it uh, on the NBR Big Data uh, Conference, which I happen to co-organize, so obviously uh, I don't think badly of the, of the paper. Um, um, many conferences, uh, there are many conferences, we tend to see the same papers, especially at the highly select conferences like at Utah. So this raises some interesting issues, but I think, but I, think I understand these issues better after hearing the first paper yesterday. Uh, so it has interesting impacts on successful papers, but it, 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 it has good impacts on successful papers, not quite such good impacts on less successful papers. Um, but the first paper in our conference highlighted the importance of home-run innovations and home-run papers. So now I understand better why we're seeing the same papers again and again. Uh, and I understand in some fields, actually, they, they don't, they're not allowed to present a paper multiple times. But obviously, that's not a comment about this paper, uh, which I think is actually a kind of a fascinating paper. Uh, anyway, so let me, let me, let me stop.